Good evening, one and all, and welcome to episode 273 of Love at First Sense with me, Persilais, coming to you live from YouTube. And as you will have gathered from the video description, today we are doing another interview. And we are very, very fortunate to have in the studio, um, I think we can safely say, one of the most acclaimed perfumers of our time. But I guess what makes him particularly interesting was that he reached the, 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 this particular position of being extremely acclaimed at a relatively young age. I don't want to say too much about him because I want to give as much time over to him as possible. But if I were to tell you that he has created perfumes for, well, you could probably name just about any brand and he would be able to tell you that he's created a perfume for it. He's created perfumes for Garlin, for Gucci, for Nina Ricci, for Tom Ford, for Bond Number no. 9. If you're a fan of Piguet, then you have a lot to be grateful for to him because he is almost single-handedly responsible for bringing a lot of the Piguet scents into their sort of current format so that we can all enjoy them. And uh, most notably for the purposes of our interview today, he is also the co-founder and perfumer of this range here called Matière Première, which launched around two and a half years ago. So I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about uh, one of the one of the one of the subjects I'm sure we'll touch on is that this he he claims to be the perfume the only perfumer or this claims to be the only brand in the world where the perfumer actually grows some of the materials that he uses in his own sense. So I'm sure that will uh, spark some questions in you, and we will definitely need to make some time for their latest release, which I've got here called French Flower. But without any further delay, please welcome to the studio. Aurélien Guichard, all the way from the south of France, near Grasse. Thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing today, Aurélien? Hello. Hi, Darius. Nice to see you. Thank you for welcoming me. And you are uh, just near Grasse, you said. What's the particular significance of the place where you are today? Uh, I'm, we're located in Tourette, which is about 20 minutes drive away from Grasse. Uh, that's actually um, a land where I grow you know, my own organic uh, rose santifolia and tuberos. So I'm actually spending uh, a few weeks now, which is a wonderful period of the year because, you know, that's where nature starts, you know, everything blooms and among many things, roses. <laughs> so, so actually that was one of the first things I wanted to ask you. We are approaching rose harvest season. How are the roses doing? How are the buds looking? Does it look like it's going to be a good year? They look incredible because we've, you know, every year is different. And this year in particular, we've been very lucky with the weather because there hasn't been any frost. So they look perfect. They, they're not opened yet. Um, they, I think in Grasse, which is, as I said, 20 minutes away, they've started to pick them up and the flowers have opened. But here they will start in a week time, probably. So we're, everybody is very excited and we're all waiting for the first one to, to open. That, that's fascinating, isn't it? That even that relatively short distance causes quite a big difference in in the in the opening time, the blooming time. Correct. Uh, in fact, uh, even uh, if you look at a field itself, um, flowers will will bloom differently uh, at different moment on the same field. So it doesn't mean they smell differently at all, but it's just that uh, when you certain part of the field will open first and, 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 and another part of the field will open a bit later. So it's, it's very interesting. And of course, uh, the fascinating thing is despite that, every year flowers will start to open on about the same day. So here in the south of France, it's in May. That's why we call Rose Santifolia Rose de May because they open and they bloom in May. But they, and, they, and we pick them up during about 31 days, 30 to 31 wow. to 29 days. So, and here it starts at around, I think, May, May 7th. So we usually pick them up till for end of the first week of June. And we've been doing it, it so just... for, for, for no, go on. three years. And it's always the same kind of days that we no, that it is it is amazing we, we we owe so much to nature really don't we now lots and lots of people have already been leaving comments those of you who watch regularly will know the drill i'm i know that 
a lot of you have got questions for Aurelien. I would say save them for the moment because if you post them now, I may miss them. But I'm, uh, and I'll tell you when it's okay to start asking the questions. But I have to, I have to share a few of these comments. James is saying hi from midnight in Jakarta. Excited <laughs> for the interview. Thanks very much for tuning in, James. Philatelic Cafe also says, this is so beyond my sleeping hours, but I have to endure. Um, Heinke is here saying, bonsoir à tous. I know that she's from a little bit closer than Indonesia. Mr. Raspopitol is saying, buongiorno di Canada. Uh, so many people tuning in. Uh, Claire is saying, hi, Persiles. Uh, Claire is in Manchester in the UK. We've got Fragtastico saying hello from Toronto. We do usually get... Uh, pretty much the whole world uh, represented here. And there was already one comment um, about Radical Rose. Woozy is saying, I enjoy Radical Rose, so hopefully this batch of Rose is a good one, they're saying. How how much Rose goes into Radical Rose? How much of the Rose from your field? Well, it's 100% um, Rose from our field. So we wow. don't use any other Rose. And when I started to create Radical Rose, I had one goal in my mind is to put the maximum quantity of rose you can put in a bottle. So, you know, we are, of course, limited because of norms, for example. So I've put just a maximum amount of it and I've tried to create a perfume around this huge uh, quantity of rose. So there's so, a lot of it and all the rose. That I have, I have to ask, here, what is the maximum amount of rose you're allowed to put in now? Oh, you've gone, you've gone, you've gone silent, Aurelien. You've gone on mute, maybe. Have you muted yourself? Sorry. No, about still that. Yeah, no, you're back. The, the the internet doesn't want you to reveal the information about how much rose we're allowed. <laughs> no, go on, you were saying. No, we, we're looking at quantities like three to four percent, four percent of rose, which is a lot. But this mm. doesn't seem to be a lot when we say so, but it's huge because you have to keep in mind that the concentration of the fragrance is also really high. So uh, this put together means that you, it's an enormous amount of rose that you have in a bottle. No, I, I no, I, I, and I think also a lot of the people watching here because you get you get real, real perfume geeks watching this channel, and I and you know I'm a perfume geek as well. I think I think we all appreciate that three percent of rose is a lot. It's so, because you, so you, you know, if, if I explain to you, Darius, if I go, you know, more in details, if you have a very concentrated fragrance, uh, then of course the amount of rose is very high. So if you have high dosage, the three percent represent a lot. Uh, the three to four percent represent a lot in in the bottle. Of course, if your fragrance is has a lower, uh, I would say, concentration level, um, you know, the three or four percent represent less. So sure. radical rose is highly dosed in that. And, and it's really yeah. something we're very proud of is, you know, when you make a production, it's also great to be able to say, OK, years after years, uh, I will be able to produce more of those rows because they will end up in the bottle because we know, the, I would say, the production is sustainable because we use such quantities. And it's something mm -hmm. that is true for radical rose when we make a rose. But it's, I think it's, uh, it's something we, we really try to do in every fragrance of matière première. When we work with a producer, by using a high dosage of that central raw material means that with time and years after years, we will keep on ordering uh, this, this ingredient, which is something that is really important for a producer because it's wonderful to make incredible perfume, but which is what you need is to secure the sourcing and to make sure people who produce ingredients, who produce raw materials, are capable of first producing but living from it and making sure that every year they will receive consistent uh, orders. Yeah. David, a uh, regular viewer, David Santiago, who's saying, I've just sprayed Radical Rose to honor this live interview. Thanks very much for that, David. Now, I want to, I want to take you back a little bit, Aurelien, because I, you know, I, think, I think it's safe to say in, in your situation that perfume completely runs through your blood. Um, your your father is a perfumer who is, I think we can say, kind of famous. I think I think he achieved quite a lot in his time. Um, your your biography says that you actually are sort of seventh generation of, of of the perfume industry in some form or another. Was was there a moment when you were a child growing up? Was there a moment when actually you realized that not everybody works in the perfume industry? That people had other jobs too. 
Yeah, it's a great question. I, actually, my mother, she's a skeptic. So okay. I grew up in an environment where there was a lot of people who were working in creative uh, environment, whether it was with marble or with raw materials for perfumery. Or, so perfume were creating fragrance, they were creating sculptures, painting. Um, so to me, I grew up with that. But I remember, and I, I was thinking about that just before we started this, uh, this session, um, I had people coming at home telling me, okay, you, you create perfume, it's wonderful. But when we experience a backstage, the reality of what you leave, whether it's your family, but your friends and people who live with you, uh, it's amazing because it's true. And that's what people are looking for, you know, honestly, and, and things that are real. And it's really something to me that I had friends who were actually live not necessarily French, but they were telling me all the time, you know, you should make that visible because it's incredible, you know, to, mm. to, to, to have access to raw materials, to be surrounded by people who have a certain conception of, I would say, luxury, but creation also in general. And that's really, to me, only came to my mind later on when I was, I think, um, a bit before my 20s. Um, I loved, uh, I studied in England. I loved the fact that, I, you know, you could work with people from different origins, from different country. And creating fragrance was just one, one way of doing it. Uh, I was more attracted by the fact at the time that I could work and collaborate with people uh, right. who were from different countries around the world. And that to me really what drove my desire to become a perfumer, you know, collaborate with people uh, from different culture, but also creating fragrances for people who were living in different parts of the world. That's really to me something that really drove my desire to share the beauty of where I was from. And and if and if you couldn't and and if something had you know been different, and you couldn't have uh, fulfilled that intention or fulfilled that desire through perfumery, what other creative field do you think you might have gone down, or was it always going to be perfume? Well, perfume, as you said, somehow I felt privileged because it was in my blood. I think my father, uh, I don't know if he's very well known or famous, but. Is certainly a master. Oh, oh yeah, he is. Field. He is. <laughs> and, yes. and and I must say, on top of what he has created, like fragrances like Lulu, like Eden, like uh, you know m many other fragrances. On top of that, he re he really was is really someone who looked up at the work of perfumer and at the work of many people who work in the perfumery industry. Uh, and you know this, I think this. Growing up with someone who has a soft and a true, honest consideration for every kind of people who work around the work of perfumer, not just perfumers, but people, people who farmers who work with raw materials, mm. uh, evaluators, um, you know, people who work in in I would say in uh, in stores. I mean, all that gives a real sense of honor to be part of this uh, of this uh, of this industry in a way even mm -hmm. though I think he was looking at it as, as more poetry than, than industry. And I really, okay. I think I really kept that with me. So what if I could have done something different? Uh, probably, I, I don't know if I would have been successful at it, but I've always loved uh, teamwork. I've always loved to, uh, to work with other people, whether it's through art, sports, you know, I will, you know it's, it's always something that drove me is sharing with people. I, I've never really understood artists who need to be alone to create. I, I'm not like that. I, mean, I, I like to create for other people. And this is the beauty of, I think, the way uh, perfumer work is when you, you don't create for yourself, but you create thinking of, is my message going to be understood? When I create a fragrance, I always ask myself, is this relevant? Is it bringing something? And is my idea going to be understood by someone who lives at the other side of the world. It's really something to me that that drives my 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 work. No, that, that's really interesting. And actually, I was going to ask you about this sort of thing a little bit later on, but we're sort of touching on this subject now. So, so I may as well ask the question now. In, in your biography, I think you 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 say that for you, perfumery is a is a legitimate form of self expression, which is kind of what you're saying here. But also at the same time you have this idea that you're working in the service of the brand or the service of the 
you know, the designer that is releasing it. What, what, what would you say, first of all, to somebody if they don't accept this idea that perfumery can be a legitimate form of self-expression? How do you try to convince somebody that it is? First, I don't try to convince many people. I, I, I okay. really feel uh, perfumery and perfume in general it has to be easygoing. I, I truly believe that everybody should have its own vision of it and everybody should be able to enjoy the fragrance he wants to enjoy. So it's really about, to me, it's really about being free. I think we live in a world where people are seeking and hoping for uniqueness and having a unique perfume is one thing and developing it in a unique way is also something very important. And I believe, you know, this goal of reaching something that is beautiful and unique, you can reach it only if you do things in, a, in, your, in your personal way. So it's, I don't feel it's very intellectual, <laughs> you know, I think okay. it's very much, it has to be instinctive and perfume smell is about, it's, it's about sharing. It's about having people feeling it's bringing something more in their life when they wear your fragrance. That's really what matters to me. And when I work for a designer or when I work for fashion house, whether it's for Burberry, for Narciso Rodriguez, for Isemiyake, I work always at the service of those, of, those, of those designers. And of course, the fact that we collaborate and we work together um, is caused by the fact that we have common appreciation of aesthetic things on, on, on an olfactory level. But I always try to write my formulas by respecting you know, the idea and the identity of a brand. Now, when I create for Matière Première, mm, uh, and I'm very lucky you, yeah. for that, it's a totally different uh, thing to me. And it's great because it's not schizophrenic at all. It's really something different that I don't work at the service of a brand, but I work at the service of a raw material. And it's, you know, my, 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 my partners and, and friends that I, that I founded Matière Première with um, always tell me that for them, my work is a bit like a photographer who will look at something and will try to show a, a, a reality with a certain angle. And we try to be, Matière Première is really much about that, trying to showcase a, a raw material in a unique way that we, by keeping a, a kind of simplicity. We, you know, when I was, a, when I started Matière Première, I actually felt you know, as perfumers, we have wonderful ingredients in our palette. And I read every single brand it makes beautiful fragrance. And I, mm. I respect that. And it's certainly true that there are masterpieces and less masterpieces. But I see beautiful ingredients everywhere. But at the same time, when I, when I look at my, uh, at my ingredients as a perfumer, uh, usually fragrances are overly mixed. They're too complex. So you cannot really feel the beauty of the raw material. I give you an example. Um, you know, if you drop, uh, if you drop a raw material on your uh, on your clothes, you will smell the raw material for days. Hmm. And many fragrances don't have that. And and I felt like you know, I think uh, it would be great to build a matière première to build a brand that really respects the original texture of an ingredient, using it in a huge quantity and just amplifying certain facets of it. Mm. I diminish certain facets that I don't, maybe that I will find less beautiful and I will amplify other ones. But with this idea that I want really to preserve the original texture of one raw material. So the, so the, you know, the idea behind the brand is very clear. The raison d'etre, if you like, of the brand is very clear, but, but starting a brand, starting a business is, is quite a big deal. So at what point did you realize that it was going to become a reality? You know, where did the original drive come from? Was it from these business partners that you mentioned? Or was it, are they friends that you just kept talking about this idea for years? How did it all start? Um, pl plenty of uh, different factors. One factor is um, I decided to start this organic farm for Rose Santifolia in 2015 or 2014. And, you know, in France, things are 
very, are a little bit bureaucratic. So it takes time between the moment you start and the moment you are actually allowed to plant uh, roses. So I, I started to do that in 2014 because my grandparents were getting really old and I felt that this knowledge was going to be lost because they were actually uh, raw material producers. They were doing roses, centifolia, jasmine, verbena. And by starting this agricultural plan, after two or three years, I thought there was something really cool. And my business partners um, were actually, that are friends, are people that I, I used to develop fragrances. They were, one of them was developing fragrances for Nina Ricci, for Valentino, for, uh, so he was a client. And the other one was actually working very much for LVMH uh, and Dior. And we thought there was something true and unique about this access to raw materials. So it's from that moment that I, I told them, well, why don't we build a brand that is about that? And so my second point, I think, so the first one was the fact that I started to grow ingredients and Matière Première came second. Uh, right. Then the fact that I had those business partners who, sh who believed in my vision that we could turn an ingredient into a fragrance. And then I think it's just, you know, a combination of saying that you feel is true to your conception of perfumery. And to me, it was easier as a perfumer to create Matière Première as long as I was true to my vision of what is a beautiful fragrance. Mm. And that's why I think that's this combination. And I was lucky enough to, to make it happen with, with Matière Première. Do, do you, I mean, obviously when you create perfumes for other clients, you, you want them to be successful. You want them to be, you know, you want them to sell. The, one of the reasons being that if you don't make successes, then you don't get wins in the future. But the pressure when you have your own business is different. Do you really, really feel that pressure that these things that you are creating ha have to sell? People have to buy them. Otherwise, the business doesn't work. Uh, I've never felt any pressure. I tell you, working for the greatest brand, I've never felt any pressure. Uh, first, because you're chosen, uh, so people choose a creation, you know. And I've, so when you start working for a brand, usually uh, many perfumers are in competition. Then, you know, when, to, when you manage to, to win a project, then of course you get closer to the brand. And the people I've been working with are usually brands or designers that I, I worked with for 10 or 20 years. So I think the fact that you keep a relationship on a long-term basis is very important because you, you get to know each other. So I've never felt really a pressure uh, about, about winning projects for designers, and I've never felt a pressure about selling fragrance for, for Matière Première. And I think maybe I'm very, I think it's, it's also part maybe of, of the beauty of this project is when we started with Matière Première, we didn't really have any expectations. The only expectation I had was, are we in a way happy with what we offer? Is it, uh, do we find the fragrances beautiful? Do we find the bottle beautiful? And do we find it true to our conception of a beauty of luxury in perfumery? And, okay. and, and that was, I think, the only pressure that maybe we had. And today, when I develop new fragrances for Matière Première, I would say that the only pressure is to, is to make sure that we are true to our values, true to, you know, all our fragrances have to get a beautiful trail. That's one thing. All our mm. fragrances have to have an overdose and all our fragrances have to be understood. I truly believe, you know, when, when I was started Matière Première, I had friends of mine around me who were working in, in fashion, in art, or in other fields. And many of them were telling me they were not wearing fragrances anymore. And in a way, they were very proud of that. And they were telling me, you know, it's cool, I don't wear fragrances. And I felt, well, you know, there's something wrong about that because they, they are cool people, they have tests, and they think it's cool not to wear a fragrance. Mm. And, and the fact that I started to, to create, I think, fragrances for Matière Première that were very simple in a way, where you could really understand what you were wearing, gave them the confidence to smell it, but also to put it on skin. And right. the whole work I do with Matière Première is I want fragrance to be long lasting, to be diffusive, but I don't want to, them to be overpowering. You know, uh, we are the opposite of too much makeup. Uh, we think it's beautiful okay. when things are a trail, people give you comments, but you don't feel 
covered by perfume. No, that's and, fair enough. And those people were and those people were happy to wear our fragrances because they could understand what they were putting on skin. If they would put cotton and cedar, they would be like, okay, I can I can understand what I'm wearing, and it, mm. and it's fine because it's very close to the idea I have of a of a lemon peel, for example. And they didn't feel overly perfumed. And after a day wearing it, they received comments, and they were coming back to me saying, "Okay, well, you know, in fact, it's nice to receive." Comments. Okay, no, th that that makes sense. That makes sense. Can I should say this one because because we're almost at the half hour mark so I should say that you're watching uh, a live interview with perfumer Aurelien Guichard here on Love at First Scent with me Persolaise and if you would like to start sending in your questions for Aurelien please do so now and it's always really really great to find out where it is that you're watching from so if you'd like to tell us where you're watching from when you ask the question please do so as well but while people are sending in some questions we should do some smelling Aurelien because you've been talking about the materials and everything and I, I think it makes sense to at least start by smelling your latest one, which is uh, French flower. Th there is lots that we could ask just about this one, but uh, if, if you could maybe tell us, um, you know, what led to the creation of it, but also a few people have already asked this um, about the difference between the enfleurage uh, method of getting the tuberose and, and, and you know, what, what other method there may be. So um, perhaps you could start with that and tell us how you revived this ancient, ancient method of enfleurage. Okay, it's very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Um, first of all, uh, French flower is made with our own organic tuberose. Tuberose in the south of France, they bloom end of August. There's from the same flower we, that we pick up every morning, we actually make two extractions. And those two extractions will give you two different products that are very unique in a way. First is uh, you get an extraction of the tuberous flower, and from this extraction, you get an absolute. So it's an extraction with volatile solvent, like any kind of extraction where you get an absolute. And the, the, the smell of it is incredible because it really repre reproduces the smell that you have when you put your nose on the flower. So it's intense, it's dense, it's complex, it's rich, it's long lasting, and it really gives a full body impression of this amazing tuberose. Um, the enfleurage is different. It's an, an ancient, ancient method, really, where you actually um, display the flowers on a, on a, 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 on some fat, some you, you literally put them on fat, don't you? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and after a few days, you take them away. You put more flowers on it, and you really what happens is the fat will suck the olfactive smell of the petals. Mm. Then you take this wax, this fat, and you distillate it. You make a steam distillation and you get an enfleurage. And the smell is incredible because it smells totally different from an absolute. You get the smell of the flowers in the air. It's much more sensual, but it's also much more uh, solar. It's, it smells like the sun. You know, those flowers, the tubereuse, during all day long, they don't smell. They are open, but they don't smell. They just capture yeah. all the sun rays. And at night, when it turns about seven at night, the, the, the smell comes. And when you walk by a field of tubereuse, the smell is incredible. And French flower was just about reproducing the smell of a tuberous field at night. Because in the south of France, there's a tale that we say young people are not allowed to walk into a tuberous field at night if they are not married because it will give them erotic smell. And we thought it was okay. It was a bit cheesy in a way, but we thought, you know, there's always a part of truth in those old stories. Mm. And, and if you happen to walk by a tuberous field at night, the smell is incredible. And it's really even more, uh, I would say, sensual than the smell of a jasmine at night. It's, it's, it's more rich. You can smell it from 200 meters away. And it's really intoxicating. It's incredible. And we felt there was no perfume that was really about that. And, tube, and French flower, for example, I think is the only, fla only fragrance made with strictly tuberose from grass, which is very rare. Wow. And we haven't used any jasmine. There's no jasmine, there's no ilon ilon. And usually tuberose scents that are amazing because I think there has been some masterpiece made are usually made with plenty of different flowers to create a beautiful, uh, tuberous smell, but it's mm. made with other flowers, whereas French flower is made strictly with tuber with tuberose. 
So was that was that particularly challenging or did it actually make the process easier? For example, you know, if you couldn't use some kind of a jasmine material to emphasize some facet of the tuberose or I try to make it simple when I speak about it, but you cannot believe how difficult it was. Um, no, well, tell us, tell us, what were the challenges? Uh, well, well, the challenge was to preserve the identity of this of, of this tuberose absolute and tuberose en fleurage. Because if I would have put a touch of jasmine or a touch of another flower, then the smell would, I wouldn't have been able to preserve the beauty of those of those products. Um, you have to keep in mind. I will tell you something. Uh, tuberose absolute from grass. The cost of one kilo is two hundred and fifty thousand euro. Two hundred and fifty thousand euro one kilo. If you look at iris, which is very an expensive ingredient, it's mm. usually around seventy thousand. So three or four times less iris than the tuberose absolute from grass. Wow. And and the tuberose absolute from India, for example, would be one kilo would be ten thousand. So twenty five times less. Which, which is fine. I mean, there's many reasons why, but mm. what I mean, it's, it's a different product and it's very unique to have a fragrance yeah. made with the tuberos from grass. And, and the idea was really to work it in a modern way. You know, um, there's been some amazing fragrances created by other brands that makes, you know, creamy, you know, I would say very intense, dark, mm. sensual tuberos. French flower is a tuberose, but worked very differently, much more, um, with a, you know, with a feeling of transparency, but yet very, you know, very, I would say very powerful, but with a kind of fluidity to be modern. Okay. This isn't a question, <laughs> but I'm going to post it because it made me laugh. This is from Natasha saying, I am old enough to walk through a tuberose field at night. <laughs> so I, I don't know whether we can direct Natasha to a tuberose field somewhere. Thanks for that. And also somebody else saying, I have no questions for him because I've seen every interview he did on YouTube and I'm so happy he is here now, made my ear. Thanks very much, Juan. That's very, very kind of you. But uh, we do we do have some questions. Here's an interesting one from Heinke saying, Aurelia, you seem to like Spanish labdanum. What is it particularly that distinguishes this from other kinds? Do you like well, Spanish uh, labdanum? I like labdanum in general, but you know, the I think you know the the labdanum that I use is mainly is from Spain. You know, it's a they do it they create they make it in Andalusia. Uh, it's uh, from labdanum. You get plenty of different ingredients. You know, cis labdanum oil, cis labdanum absolute. You get many resinoid uh, products from it, and it, it's really something that gives depth. And I would say something very essential that not many people know. And I, yeah, I do, I do, I do agree. It's true. I love, I love cis labdanum from Spain. Ah, interesting. Okay, so somebody picked up on that one. Here's uh, something about your growing. Woozy is saying, do you have any plans to grow your own irises? Um, I actually, I, I kind of um, thought about that this year. Iris is very complex because they must stay in the ground for many, many uh, years. And uh, it's, um, it needs a lot of knowledge. And for now, I don't feel I'm knowledgeable enough. Uh, so, you know, I'm actually starting to study other cultures that we, we will be starting next year, uh, but not Iris for now. Okay, okay, fair enough. And here, this is, this is I'm, I told you people watching these videos are, are super um, interested in, in the technicalities of perfume. This is Jazz Bob saying, in the video for Bois de Ben, I saw your notebook saying Ambroxan, Cipriol Essence, Isoe Super, Vertovix Coeur, Cashmiran, Cedramber, Ambercore. How many nat how much naturals did you use? <laughs> it's it's a it's a good question. You know, among the ingredients that are quoted, you, you see Cipriol is a is a natural one. In Bois de Ben, yeah. the fragrance is made mainly with different kinds of woods. So i you know, Bois de Ben, for example, is a, is almost like a patchwork of wood. The main ingredient is Gaillac wood. But I wanted to darken this Gaia wood. So I've used some okay. patchouli, some cipriol. We even have another wood called Cabreva oil from Brazil. And all those woodiness, woody ingredients give texture. But in order to make sure your fragrance is modern, you also use other ingredients that sometimes um, are synthetics. And synthetics are important. I don't believe in 100% natural fragrances. I think mm. some can be beautiful. But matière première is, is not about 100% natural. It's about a huge quantity of natural. But I do need, when I create, I do need some of those 
synthetic ingredients like Vertofix, mm -hmm. like Ambroxan. Ambroxan is an ingredient that I use in almost every every fragrance of Matière Première because those ingredients will give light in, through the fragrance. You know what I love when it comes to art, for example? I love not only what happens when a drawer will draw a line, what I love is also what happens between the line. And what happens between in a fragrance is also what happens between the ingredients. And those synthetic ingredients really help to embellish the natural lines. Mm. And it, interesting you should say that, because this is a question from Eric that I'll put to you. Uh, as a painter, he says, I was wondering what Aurelien thinks of when he's creating a scent um, based on famous paintings, since his perfumes to me feel very creative, using ingredients almost like a painter using his brush. Do you have some like other artworks in mind when you're creating your scents? Um, I tr I do. I, uh, to me, it's not so much about one painting. It's more about the technique. I think my, my work would be closer to a painting made um, uh, with um, with oil painting, okay. and but because I like texture, I like when on a painting you it's not flat. You know, I like when you can feel the texture or something. But what I like the most is I don't feel my inspirations are so important. What I love is when I see people writing this writing these kind of comments because it means that my story became their story and the inspiration they find. Uh, something relevant linked to art. I, I, I actually don't, uh, you know, I could tell you that um, I travel the world and I find an inspiration to create a perfume, but it's not the case. I'm very factual. When I smell an ingredient and I find an ingredient is absolutely beautiful, I, I, I feel like for Matière Première, I have to turn this ingredient into a perfume. And that's really, to me, what drives my, 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 cre my creation for Matière Première. Not so okay. much art, but, but the raw materials. Now, you, uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that the brand is now in 40 different countries. Is that right? Or it's, it's in quite a lot of countries. Was that we should we, we should smell another one. Can you tell me one that was received in quite a surprising way in a in a in a foreign market? You know, like maybe one where you thought, oh, I did not expect them to like that one so much. Was there one like that? I, I would tell you almost all of them. What I love about what I'm discovering with Matière Première is I truly believe, uh, I don't believe in the fact that people have certain tests in certain region. Okay. And I, I really see that, for example, uh, fragrances like Falcon Leather is doing really well in Asia, for example. And most of people would think Asian people uh, we like, um, I would say, transparent. You know, Chinese people will like transparent scent. And so, when true. you say when you say Asia, do you mean, for example, China and not so yes. much Middle East? But okay, okay. But, no, but that I guess what, that isn't. What, yeah, go on. What I would like to say is, I truly believe. Yes, I love the fact that uh, you can't predict what people will like. Um, I love the fact that people like radical rose. Many people don't like rose fragrance, and they love radical rose because they say it offers a different um, a different angle on, on the rose ingredient. Falcon leather, many people say, well, usually leather is a bit old fashioned, but when they wear falcon leather, they feel, oh, it's modern, it's easy to wear, it's powerful, but it's not overwhelming. So it's... So talk to us about falcon leather then, because a leather in perfumery is not strictly speaking a natural material. So what was the particular material you wanted to showcase in that one? So it's birch tar. And okay. in fact, birch, birch tar oil is a, a vegetal leather note. So first I thought that was interesting to work on a vegetal leather, but also, you know, coming from Grasse, you know, in the south of France, Grasse became, the, I, I would say, the capital. I, I don't know if everyone would share that, but, you know, in the, in, in the 80, um, 1800, 1900, um, gloves were made in the south, in, in Italy, and they were transported to Versailles. And on the way, they were stopped. They were fragranced in in grass because they were smelly because they were made with animalic skin, and that's how grass started to be a town of perfume because they were fragrancing the gloves. And in a way, we I felt let's do the another way around. What if I would recreate the smell of a glove? And there was those falconier gloves that I thought were so impressive to me. And I said, okay, what would be 
what would be the smell of this of this leather? You have one slick side, one suede side, and I try to repre represent this texture of this two side texture of a leather. That's really how okay. I created uh, Falcon Leather. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. This is a business related question in a way, distribution question from David, saying how soon will the brand have US distributors? Uh, we will uh, matière première. I mean, it has been announced, so I can say it. But okay. we will launch in the US uh, with a, a wonderful, we you know, partner is ICP, and we will be uh, starting matière première uh, in I think autumn uh, of this year in the US. So before the end of the year. year. Yes, North America. Excellent, excellent. Canada, US. Brilliant. Eric is saying, is there a particular perfume by another perfumer that you admire? Oh, you're not allowed to is... choose one by your. You're not allowed to choose one by your father. <laughs> no, but you can actually if you want. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There are so many. Uh, you know, yeah. I am so admirative of a lot of per, uh, work from other perfumers. You know, on holidays, I love to work per, to wear perfume that are created by others because I don't know ah. the formula, and I and I love the fact that I can spend a day with something that was created by someone else. You know, I've, I, I've loved uh, L'Odyssée, we are created by Jacques Allier. I've loved Diorum, created by uh, Olivier Fudge. Uh, mm. I, I have loved uh, For Her by Narciso Rodriguez. Yeah, I, there's so many fragrances that I, I wish I could, <laughs> I could have created, really. And, and I've, I've been so lucky because I've worked, uh, you know, during 20 years, for Givaudan, then I worked. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, I worked at Givaudan for 14 years. I worked at Firminich for a few years. Now I work at Takazako, and I've been collaborating and working with some of the greatest perfumers that became friends. Mm. And that's also something including, I including love. quite a lot, quite a lot with Christine Nagel, right? Uh, you made lots of with her. Yeah, with Christine, uh, with Alberto mm. Morias, with Antoine mm. Dieu, with Olivier Pecheux, with a dear friend of mine. Uh, yeah. with plenty of different perfumers. And, and I must say that uh, what I've loved always is the diversity of people, the diversity of way of living, um, of vision on, on, on the perfume. And so I've worked with some of the greatest uh, yeah. became friends. And, and when I look at what they've, they've done, I often think, oh, you know, they, you know, what a great, what, what, what a great creation they've made. Now, th this is kind of, I think we know the answer to this question, but it's sort of related to what you were saying just now. This is from Olfacto Story, who says, Hi, Aurelia. Greetings from Germany. I'm a big fan of your work. Are you still creating fragrances for designers and other clients, or are you just creating perfumes full time for your for Matière Premier? Um, I, I still create for designers. I mean, lately I've been creating um, Eero by Burberry. Uh, the Narciso Rodriguez fragrances, Ambre. So, yes, I keep on creating. Uh, some fragrances for many designers, Carven, uh, you know, really it's, it's wonderful because I feel I, I'm, I'm, luck I'm a lucky perfumer because I can work for my brand and I can also work for designers who want to work with me. So, uh, and, and in that respect, I, I, I must say that I work for a wonderful company called Takazako who really gave me this freedom. Uh, Francis Curjean, for example, who is also a friend, uh, worked at Takazako while he was creating Middle Francis Curjon and creating fragrances mm. for other brands. So yes, I, I still do and I, and I feel very fortunate to be able to do both because I don't think I would be happy to do only one, you know. If I would, I, I love to work for other people and it's a total different exercise. Do you do you have some kind of a, a system or a process that you follow when you make a perfume for another brand? You know, even if it's like a even if it's like a sort of silly thing, like you will listen to a particular piece of music when you create for such and such a brand. I, I don't know. Yeah. Is there is there a process? Yes, uh, I have a very specific process. To me, the important thing when you're a perfumer is, of course, to have a good inspiration at first, an idea. But it's also how do you translate it into a perfume? So it's a bit like for you. If you write a story, depending on who you read or write it for, you won't use the same words. And so what I usually do is I usually go, if I work for a fashion brand, I go to a store. Uh, I look at the people who, who, who wear the, the clothes of that designer. Um, eventually, I talk to them or I talk to the people who work in that store. I, I, I go to libraries. I look for documentation. I look for the history. 
I look really for every kind of uh, important and detailed element of, uh, of a brand. Then I usually try to also understand the couturier who is behind the brand, the person who is creating for the brand, what kind of person he is, and I try to, to have a feeling of that. Then I, I, I rest for a little bit. I, I leave a bit of time and I try to find someone who will embody the fragrance I try to create. So mm -hmm. it can be someone I know, someone unknown, someone in the street. It can be just a way of expressing your, someone who will make a gesture or something. And I will feel, okay, this is, this is what I want to create. This has to translate this moment or this or that person. And then I, you know, starting from that, I will keep this idea in mind and I will start from a, from scratch. I always start from a um, blank paper and I will write a formula and try to turn what I have in my mind into a smell. And and when you come to making creations for Piguet, which is such a beloved brand in so, in so many ways, how do you express that particular DNA of Piguet? You know, how, how would you explain it to somebody who maybe... This is a... Uh, Piguet is a different, different way of working. Okay. Love for fragrances that were created by Piguet were created by Germaine Cellier. She was mm. a, a, an amazing perfumer. So a lot of, you know, I started to work for Piguet in 2005 and a lot of the work was about respecting the past. And, and I, I say in a very humble way, um, when I worked on existing formula, I really wanted to make sure that I was respecting the original ingredients and the original way the formula was created. So certain ingredients at the time, because the fragrances were made in the 50s, uh, sometime in the 60s, were not uh, existing anymore. So the whole mm -hmm. idea was to make sure that we kept the quality. And if, we, if the ingredients were not existing anymore, how do we re replace them? And how do we stay close to the original formula? And when I say that, it's a lot of the work is of course, what I do, but a lot of the thing was also um, a lot of the task is also made by the brand because there was no price restriction. So it's also right. about that. And, and I think working for Piguet with people who are really believing in the quality of ingredients gave me a very strong belief and in building matière première because you know when you buy a matière première fragrance, a bit like when you buy a Piguet fragrance even though they are in a very distinctive style, uh, they use exceptional ingredients. And I truly believe that when a formula, uh, when the price of a formula is so high, it smells different from the rest. I don't say it smells better or, you know, I think it's yeah. up to everyone, but it diffuses differently because you don't use the same ingredients and you don't use ingredients in the same proportions. Okay. And we'll let uh, take one final question from the audience here from David, who's saying, I have high respect for Orleans creations. Do you have a signature behind your scents? Because he says they're all so different. So is there a signature or actually is the point not to have a signature? I would, I would love to think I don't have a signature. I think there is a signature behind Mathia Premier Fragrances because there's a common uh, a common element behind every fragrance of matière première, but I, I truly believe that my my work is about being at the service of brands, couturier, or raw material. So maybe that's my style. <laughs> no, no, well, and I, I kind of thought you were going to say that. Um, thank you so much for your time, Aurélie, and congratulations on the launch of the brand and on the latest perfume as well. Thank you uh, very much to everybody who's been watching and been so excited, leaving lots and lots of comments, way, way, way too many comments that, that, that I could share. Thank you very much for all the great questions. I'll leave you with one final question. Um, clearly, you are a figure of some inspiration for a lot of the people watching, you know, a lot of the people who uh, read about perfume and try to find out about perfume. What what advice would you give to somebody about per entering the perfume industry if they don't come, you know, if they don't come from France, if they don't come from Grasse, if they don't have perfumery in their family, what advice would you give them? I would give uh, two advice. Uh, first advice is you need to believe that you can, uh, that you can create. Everybody I think is capable of creating perfume. It's about 
it's a bit like painting. Everybody can be a painter. Now, you know, can you be a good painter or not? That's another question. Um, and I had someone told me once is you have to be a happy person, but that's very personal. You have to be an optimistic person and believe that things will happen. I also feel that when you start in this industry, the most important thing is to identify someone that you look up to, someone that you admire and that you feel, okay, I will try to work with this person. I will do my best. Maybe I will make photocopies, coffee, uh, make sure I, I show that I'm, I'm ready to, to learn with this person and to help. And if the person see uh, that you're motivated and wants to help you, you're in, the, you're in a great direction for doing your dream and achieving your dreams. If you don't admire anyone, then you, choose, you should just change company and, and, and find <laughs> elsewhere someone you admire. I think admiring someone is so important. In whatever you do, you need to look up at some people and feel, okay, I, I, I relate to that. And, and this is what drives my, that's why I wake up every day. So find a good role model is the advice. Now that's great. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, everybody, for watching. And thank you, Orly, and thank you so much for joining us and, and all the best to you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for, you know, talking about Matière Première and, and for the support of people who, who like what we do. Not at all. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone.